Our next speaker, Professor Emeritus Richard Teague, was supposed to become a rancher in South Africa, but after his grassland and biology, ecology degrees, was then invited after a couple of, of years of doing great research uh, because he was so good as a rangeland ecologist. He was invited to work with Texas AgriLife Research. Um, and for 30 years, he worked there to retire just a year ago and finally become a rancher. Um, and so the reason for him, for having him is not just because he worked with uh, regenerative ranchers in many environments. And so he's neither dazed nor confused about grazing, um, but it's also because he's audacious enough to question in a very no-nonsense way some of the basics in soil science like the carbon saturation. So please welcome Richard Teague. Richard, you have the floor. Good afternoon. If you can't hear me at the back, please signal. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. As he mentioned, I grew up on a farm in Zimbabwe, and um, I have been a researcher all my professional life, and I was asked to join the Te Texas A&M research uh, in 91, and I've been working there since. So because I grew up on a farm, the kind of research I do is specifically for farmers, not for people who want to sell products to farmers. So this is the paradigm that I work within. It's, it's a, a systems-wide holistic framework. And the goal of our research has been to find the best grazing management for regenerating soil health. Good thing Christy's not here. Uh, and ecological function, delivery of ecosystem goods and services, and farmer livelihoods and social resilience. So the observations that I made on coming to the States um, I asked the USDA NRCS, who does the soil mapping in Texas, to introduce me to those farmers who had the highest soil carbon. Without exception, that was with people using regenerative multi-camp grazing, or better known as holistic planned grazing, developed by Alan Savory, uh, following the, the uh, example of Andre Vosson from France. And we have found that all the outstanding managers achieve much better resource and economic outcomes than research scientists. So we partner with these managers to improve the uh, um, outcomes. Most current science really considers, let alone studies, unintended consequences outlined by quite a few of the speakers before me, um, resulting from their different actions, and generally aims at how to achieve maximum yields use biocides to kill pest problems and pests, and, and uh, maximizing short-term profits to sell solutions. Maximum yield is almost never at the point of the highest profits. Uh, so you have to take that into account, as Chris indicated. So what is needed is improving the understanding of the biological and ecological function at meaningful scales. So much research is done uh, on areas about the size of this building very few people manage ranches um, at that space, and we need to consider. So I work for uh, with leading ranches right through North America to address uh, things at meaningful scales, integrate component science into whole systems, going from soils all the way through to economics, and um, the human element of finding out what are the best ways to manage, you only learn from the really good managers. So we concentrate quite a bit on that. So the outline uh, for my talk is why we have achieved very different results than other researchers, uh, the soil biology and fully functional grazing ecosystems, and research results from North America, and managing to improve soil health for full ecological and economic benefits. I must point out at this stage that most of my work is done on native grasslands in North America, uh, dominated by C3 grasses. Uh, and But we, some of the work we've done east of the Mississippi is with domesticated um, C3 plants, uh, perennial plants, 
but the, the management principles associated with each is exactly the same. <clears throat> so our research hypothesis is that if you increase soil carbon, all the following really important uh, functions actually are improved. And we are, are studying each one of those things. We have a, had a research group of 26 scientists in uh, 15 dis different disciplines in order to address each of those things. So let's start at the beginning and indicate why we get different results. Before white people moved into America, the, the ecology of the grazing systems, as in most of the grazing systems around the world, was what the bison had achieved with wolves chasing them around, etc. As soon as conventional grazing that, that we know it today was practiced, the levels of soil carbon dropped precipitously. But when the regenerative grazers began some 30 years ago in North America, based on earlier work that we had done in Southern Africa, um, we had a huge increase. Uh, Chris mentioned some of the levels of carbon that we have achieved, um, and I'll indicate that in the past. So most research scientists work in a degraded situation, and they do research for about two or three years, and then think they've solved the problem and they use onto something else and get a few publications out of it. So what we have done uh, with the regenerative grazers is find out after they've been operating for a number of years that, that we through experience have, have found uh, is enough time for changes to be measurable. And we've also measured not at 30 centimeters depth, sometimes at uh, 20, we have measured at least a meter in many places down to two meters. So we've collected initial data from many people, um, but our, our in, intensive research sites are much more limited. So looking at the, um, the biggest limiting factor in most of our grazing lands, as with cropping, is not the amount of rainfall you get, but the amount that gets into the soil. This is taken on the same ranch uh, in northern Mexico that we've been working on, on the left-hand side before they started, implementing good regenerative grazing, no inputs whatsoever, and after 20 years, they achieved that situation on the right. But that's not the only thing you need to consider. You need to consider the amount of energy that's, that's captured to feed for the plants to feed the soil, the hydrological function, how much are you capturing and maintaining in the soil, the mineral cycling, often you're mineral limited, so you need a quick uh, mineral cycling in the way you manage things and you need to correct community dynamics and the right human component to get the, the management right. So biologically, 90% of the soil function is mediated by microbes, but they depend on the plants. They get all the, their food from the plants. So how you manage that complex is critical to getting success or not. So microbes are very, very fun, uh, Im important. So in terms of the first pr prerogative, uh, that of soil aggregation to facilitate infiltration, um, fungi are, are there and you have to manage for fungi and manage specifically so the plants are actually feeding the fungi to get the best results. You improve nutrient access, the extent of the root volume, which in dry areas is very critical to handling droughts. You, uh, you change nutrient cycling, uh, increase water uh, infiltration and uh, retention. And the highest growth that we have measured in the plants is when you've got a fungal domination um, and you've got to manage to enhance each one of those fates. The best fertilizer in the world for plants is earthworm poop. So managing for these little critters to actually function really well is fundamentally important. And in our environments, uh, dung beetles too, three different, main different kinds of, of uh, dung beetles. And you can see that they uh, make inroads into the soil, facilitating water getting in the ground. So in a high density uh, rotation that, that we used, grazing for a day or two, and then giving an adequate rest of between 70 to 90 or days or more, um, you get a lot of uh, fertilizer added in very close uh, densities, which facilitates the, the populations of dung beetles, and they thrive under that kind of grazing. So this is an area of 3,000 acres in Texas, and the green dots 
are the GPS points for a full year. And you'll see that they graze where they want to, and they don't necessarily graze the whole area, which overburdens those areas they graze, and they slowly but surely degrade. Um, so you end up with bare ground after a while, even if you're very lightly stocked. That is not a sustainable entity. And most research is done at that scale, and I think you'll appreciate that doing research at that scale doesn't produce results that relate to the size of scale on a commercial ranch that's in the background there. That's why we work with commercial ranches. So here's a picture of light continuous grazing on the left and heavy on the right. Patch selective grazing on the left. Uh, the the uh, preferred patches are grazed to the ground. How do you, deep do you think their roots are? Very shallow. How, do, how well do you think that that will handle uh, in a drought and survive? That's where you, you get death in a drought and you get bare ground like you can see on the right hand side there. So the plants that aren't grazed there, they're starting to shelf shade already because they're not taken down. And with time like next a year after this, there'll be significant amount of shading which impinges on the amount of energy that you're actually capturing to drive your whole ecosystem. Here's a point, this is in six months, uh, 320 acres, uh, correctly stocked according to the university levels. And you see they're utilizing just a small portion and overutilizing it. So you there's a lot of wastage there, inefficiency from an eco ecological point of view. And uh, the way you get around that is you use uh, adaptive multi paddock grazing. You divide the area, you can see the fences, um, and you have water points where you need them, and you limit them to a small area for a short period of time. When it's correctly grazed, you moved on to the next one. You don't come back again until they've recovered. And that means you have very deep roots. You allow all your, your most productive and preferred species to flourish, so your whole ecosystem slowly improves. Uh, because you can control how much is grazed, when it's grazed, and manage the recovery periods. And the animals then graze the whole landscape, so you're spreading the grazing of the whole area to minimize any degradation. And if you keep your animals' numbers correct within this framework, you, you effect very important changes. Just across the river from where we work in about a, a 700 millimeter rainfall area, tall grass prairie, You'll see a couple of tall grasses here, that good native grass uh, species, but the rest of it is all weedy species that have very low nutritional value and they decrease your overall productivity. So the Noble Foundation who did this work, they developed the area with one, a single water point, um, simulating 18 paddocks. So you graze one for a short period of time, you graze the, the species you want, the right amount, then you get out of there and you come back again when they're ready to graze again. So the results that we got in this experimental framework are, are this from 1988 on the left to 97, you had nearly a fourfold increase in the total number of grazing days from that area. Productivity increased hugely. And we are measuring that sort of thing right across the board in North America. Uh, where uh, management has been uh, applicable. So the first thing to do is to aim to improve ecological function as the base to increase your profits, not through purchases. Use flexible stocking, spread the grazing over the whole ranch, grazing one paddock at a time, grow, moderately graze in the, in, the, in the growing season so the recovery afterwards is rapid, Use short grazing periods, you minimize the damage to the plants and allow adequate recovery so everything recovers and moves on. But as every year is very different, you need to adjust your numbers according to the forage growth rate so you've got enough uh, plant material left behind after you've grazed to effect ecological improvements. So let's just now consider the amp grazing the light continuous, the heavy continuous, and no grazing at all in terms of each one of these things. You can see there that's got a whole platform of all these things working well. It's just a solar panel connecting energy. Over here, even though you've got much lower numbers, you've got 
plants that are growing up tall, they're shading out. The water cycle might be reasonable, but the mineral cycle is very poor because the plants grow up and they maintain the minerals in the plant. They're not recycled. So it's not a very efficient system. Now, a lot of the, uh, the green people will tell you, why don't you just not graze at all? And, and then the damage by the cattle will not be evident. So after 15 years of no grazing at all, this is tall grass prairie, same as there. Big blue stem, little blue stem, fantastic grasses, but they're so tall they shout out everything else. And if you looked in there, there'd be just bare ground in between. These wolfy plants are just shading everything out. So all the ecosystem functions are actually extremely poor. And this is just all these fa factors are very high with AMP, and these not nearly as much. Can't see. And on the no grazing has high infiltration, but very poor everything else. So our initial research uh, in Texas um, was in a in a 18, 800 millimeter area on three um, close by counties. We located an amp grazing, a heavy grazing, and a light grazing in each of those. And we've got the three counties because that introduces the concept of a replication. It's not a true replication, but when you do statistical analysis, finding the same things happening in each one of those areas is enough to get a good stats result. So the amp grazing gave three tons of carbon per hectare per year, more than the usual grazing practiced in that area. We improved the plant species enormously, restoring almost to pristine conditions the number of species that uh, occurred in the past. We increased the fungal uh, to bacterial ratio from one to one to two to one, improved the soil water holding capacity, plant productivity, decreased the bare ground, improved soil fertility, and increased livestock production. When you walked onto each of these farms, you noticed that the biomass on each farm was double at least on the amp grazing, even though they had up to three times as many animals because you, were, uh, you weren't overgrazing and you were allowing a recovery. And that's what drove the productivity that resulted in extra carbon being put into the ground. And that emulates the way we, we believe the, uh, the bison ecosystems and from other grazing systems like Africa actually evolved is using those. So based on this, <clears throat> the, um, the three tons per hectare we measured in that pro uh, project, we wanted to find out if we go north up into Canada, what happens? If we go west to drier country or go east to wetter country, what are the results? So up in the cold country, a little bit less, but it, there's less growing conditions there. In the very dry country, substantially less, but all the right things were happening with the four ecosystem processes. Then when you move to where there's a uh, thousand millimeters of rain, suddenly you're into seven to eight um, tons of carbon per hectare per year uh, in a much shorter period of time. So we, we understand the the not exact uh, results that you get from doing comparisons after a length of time. So we measured with um, labeled CO2, the instantaneous um, fixing of CO2 uh, across the fence line from amp and continuous grazing. And we came up with a difference of three tons per hectare, measured at exactly the same time of the year, same time of the day. So we've, we've got a fair amount of confidence in the overall results we're getting. So on the strength of that, we, uh, we got uh, very big grants to expand the number of disciplines we were looking at. And you can see the, the blue circle there in Kentucky in the north, then uh, Tennessee, two in Alabama and one in Mississippi. Uh, slightly different, much cooler at the, in the north to very hot in Mississippi. And uh, that's, that's we've, a project we just finished now. We finished all the, the publications. And we had extra um, disciplines, uh, fungal, bacteria, earthworms, dung beetles, birds, and the, the uh, effects on the farmer and the health of the livestock included in the different studies. So this is the summation of the five sites, the means of the five sites. On the left-hand side there, you've got the uh, carbon stocks, and this is nitrogen stocks. 
This is the amp grazing, which had no additions, just the grazing difference. This is the normal way of farming, where they put about 60 kilograms of N and fertilized, so the P levels and, and K levels were, were right. And you will see that we fixed much more carbon just in five years um, than, than with the, the control. And then when you went to nitrogen stocks, even though the nitrogen was added here, we still ended up with more naturally, biologically um, generated nitrogen in the system. And that's why they did very well. They, they were carrying two to three times as many animals as the, the continuous graze. And this, the important part of this, is that the AMP increased the more persistent MAOM fraction at all depths. So that's, that's not just part-time, this is recalcitrant stuff that's going to stay there for a while. So then um, one of the, the uh, consultant groups we work with, all these stats here, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, uh, Missouri, New York, and North Dakota, they were treated in, they were measured in year one when the amp grazing started, and then again in, in year five. And although they started at different points here, you'll see that the rate of, of, of gain was very, very similar across the board. Now bear in mind, that this is only measured to 200 millimeters depth. And we know that as deep as the roots go, you're going to be adding carbon, which I showed you previously. So this is a gross underestimate of, of the amount that can be fixed. And the mean that was added over that five-year period was an increase of 8.6 tons per hectare per year with the amp grazing uh, compared to the control. A huge increase. So we also measured the, the uh, soil microbial biomass at the beginning, the red and green at the end, and you can see how much the biological uh, component actually increased. That's total uh, biomass of mi microbial component. In the important um, infiltration capacity, um, most of these, the, the AMP was very much higher this one here was right at the foothills of, of the Rockies up in Alberta. And because you can't abuse uh, your, your grazing in summer or your animals will die in winter in, in that harsh environment, the people were very, um, they didn't hit the, the vegetation hard at all. And we believe that that is why that's, it's virtually the same on both sides. This site here was southern Alberta, which had seven years prior drought and we think that just dampened any effect that, that we, uh, we measured. So coming back to Georgia, which has got more than uh, 1,500 millimeters of rain, um, moving from a, um, an abandoned cropping area, put down to perennial pastures and uh, irrigated uh, within a dairy system. And these are the results they got. There was a bit of a lag effect there. And then over the six years, they had a huge increase and suddenly it actually plateaued off. Now, I'm not going to go into this too much. We haven't got time now. But this is one of the things we need to address is how long can these increases actually last? Up in North Dakota and in, in Canada, we've been measuring increases. It's increased every year for 16 years from 1%, what Chris told us about, up to 16% just with good grazing. So we haven't found the top end yet. So let's go now to the effects of water, uh, looking not just at the farm or paddock level, but up at the watershed level. So you can see here, this is North Dallas down here, and this is, uh, I think it's 200 kilometers away. We've the, uh, uh, Weirs were put in here to measure the runoff and the amount of uh, um, nitrogen coming through the systems and phosphate. Um, and, and we, we checked it out over a period of from 1980 to 2013. These are the ranches we actually worked on. Um, so here the red is the amount of runoff, the water, the rainfall coming in and running straight off, and the green is actually going in the ground. So on the left-hand side, the, the heavy continuous, you'll see lots of runoff, lots of erosion. As soon as you have a light number of animals on there, it evens up a little bit, great improvement. But the really important thing is how much better these two were 
This is the no gray situation I showed you a picture of earlier. And this is the the uh, areas that in the three different counties that we looked up with, with amp grazing. There was no statistical difference between those two on the right. When you looked at the nitrogen loads, almost exactly the same sort of thing. Um, nitrogen loads coming through the system um, were very um, much better with AMP and the exclosures and the results of the phosphorus levels pretty much the same. So hanging on to nutrients much better with the improved uh, biology. So this is now in, in uh, a 600 millimeter area in West Texas. And this is up in, in North Dakota on Gabe Brown's place. I think a lot of you have heard of Gabe Brown. So this is the amount of flooding that has occurred relative to the heavy continuous. So light continuous had 20 less, and these two had 67 less than the, the control. And very similar results here, uh, almost matching the others. Um, so you can see with the improved management, uh, you're getting a uh, much less effect of flooding and everything, which uh, is a very negative thing for the population at large. Of course, we always get attacked if you've got cattle involved or livestock of any sort uh, because of the emissions factor. So this, these are results from um, work done by the uh, USDA research scientists just on, on uh, continuous grazing. And you'll see the light continuous there, the amount of uh, sequestration relative to emissions is huge. That's a little bit less on the heavy continuous, um, but both of those, there's more sequestration than the emissions from the cattle while they're grazing those perennial pastures. So these are the results from our, our work that I've been t talking about so far. Uh, you can see even the, the heavy continuous uh, sequestration is much higher than uh, emitted. On the, the light continuous, it's much, much better. And the AMP is uh, a big improvement above that. This is my, a, a colleague of mine, uh, Jason Roundtree at Michigan State, and he had very similar results. As soon as you irrigate an area uh, indicated on the right there, then you increase the amount of emissions, and that's from all the irrigation uh, carbon-related things that we included in the, the this, uh, publication. So the next thing you come across is all the animal scientists say, no, you need to stick your cattle in a feedlot because they grow much more quickly and therefore the amount of emissions is emitted over a lower uh, time sequence, which is quite true, but that's not the real world. If you take into account each one of those circumstances with the amount of time grazed by the mother cows and the animals that you're feeding, uh, then you've got the situation on the right-hand side there, which is a net decrease in the carbon footprint compared to actually feeding the feedlots. So this is, you know, the real life as it occurs. So one of the things we found, we did a little bit of GHG studies at the soil level, and the first one we're looking at is uh, CO2. The blue is the... Uh, the CO2, which is respiration of the AMP, and you'll see it's higher than the other two. Um, and that's just because of the extra activity of the soil microbes uh, giving off that respiration. The next one, that's not coming through, that is N2O. And you'll see that there's two spikes there. And that is in rangelands, when they're relatively dry, they are aerobic. But as soon as they get wet for a short period of time when rain has just fallen, they are anaerobic and those spikes are peaks because of the anaerobic activity just after the normal kind of rains. And you'll see that the blue amp is substantially less um, emissions of nitrous oxide. And this is the uh, methane and exactly the same applies. You become uh, uh, non-aerobic for a short period of time. You get the peak, and the AMP, again, is because of the extra biological component, we believe, um, is not emitting nearly as much. So let's get on now to managing to improve soil health and ecosystem services. So these are very much 
uh, a repeat of what Chris gave you. Um, you've got to keep your four ecosystem process functioning. You've got to keep good plant cover, use multiple species of forage, increased biodiversity, benefits above and below ground, use perennial plants rather than annuals, manage for the most productive plants and for the most productivity of the plants and leave plant uh, uh, residue so that the ground is shaded and that provides a good uh, living environment for the uh, the microbes. You've got to minimize bare ground. In 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 midsummer, um, in in an, in an amp pasture where you've got uh, like uh, only got 10% bare ground, your temperatures go up to about 90. We we're in F, sorry. So, um, but the areas next door which have got up to 40% bare ground under continuous grazing, the temperatures go up to 160, which kills uh, bacteria. Sorry, I'm not in C. I grew up with C, but I had to change when I went to the States. So, and the other big thing is to manage for green leaves for as many days as possible through the year. And you can change your management to affect that. And we, we got people who are doing it very well. It's also, it's allied to improving the nutrition for your cows for the longest period of the year. The two go hand in hand. And of course, the readies at the bottom are things to avoid. Um, obviously, you can't sometimes, but you've got to learn from that. So now just a couple of quick ones. We've learned from uh, all those ranches that we showed there. It takes a minimum of 10 paddocks to stop overgrazing. The reason why is with eight or fewer paddocks, you are grazing for such a long period of time, two to three weeks, and then you have to come back too quickly before they've recovered again. So you are rotationally overgrazing. To support decent animal performance takes 14 to 16. The most rapid range improvement takes 30 or more paddocks. It's just strip grazing in, uh, just with a, a single strand electric fence. And once you train your animals to do that, they're easy, you just whistle and go there and open the gate and all walk through and they're eating again. And you can check them at the same time. So the ease of management, it sounds difficult, but it makes it so much easier. It's just a different mindset, different paradigm. And the biggest decrease in workloads is greatest with greater than 50 paddocks. We wanted to find out, okay, what's the top end of what we can achieve? But we also, our, our research covered, if you drop back from that top end, to the lower levels, what do you lose at each one of them? So everybody's got to choose what they're comfortable with, but we can actually tell them this is what you lose if that's the spot you actually want to, to manage around. I'm supposed to go forward. So the fastest and, and cheapest ways to create more paddocks is combining herds, which people throw up their hands in horror, but as soon as you've done it and, and you know how to do it, no problem at all. There's much less work with checking one paddock than to go and check your whole farm every single time. And it's just a very easy thing to live with. The productivity per acre is improved without decreasing in animal performance. Carrying capacity and total productivity are greatly increased at very low cost. And you must be smart. You must use your eyes. You, you can't just do things in a recipe. You've actually got to look what happens because rainfall doesn't go equally over your ranch. So uh, the paddock that needs to be grazed next, you've got to keep in touch with things and make a decision accordingly. And basically all the results that we came across and those consultants at the bottom there are amongst the most uh, respected consultants in the US, uh, they, they just maintain you can't afford not to have a, 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 an adaptive type system. So I have to deal with this because so much research actually hasn't taken these into account. You've got to account in your research layout for the increasing heterogeneity. The larger the, 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 the property, the more selective damage they do at preferred spots. And you don't notice it at first, but it catches up on you. And as soon as you, you've degraded those spots, they're gone and you can't get them back with what caused them. So the other thing is, in rangelands, the dry areas, changes in biology, even if you've changed to a substantially better uh, management, 
you can't do the normal research for three years and then call it done. You've got to go through, and, and we've managed to do this, um, two wet and dry cycles, which normally takes 10, 15 years before you get a handle on how your system responds to any kind of grazing. And that is why we chose to go to people where we had found out that they had achieved high carbon levels and worked with them so we could say, okay, this is the top end. Now we know, now we can study any changes we make, where do we lose and where do we gain? So those have got to be part. Adequate time must be allowed for treatments being tested from 15 to 30 years. As we saw uh, across the Mississippi, the 1,000 millimeters of rain, five years does it. But you go to New Mexico, 30 years, and you're only just scratching the surface. So how much research actually takes that time factor into account? Very, very little. And management must be conducted to achieve, people have got to know, the manager has got to know how to manage adaptively or he'll mess it up. And that's why we wanted to say, okay, this guy knows what's happening. He's achieved good results. This is how he's done it. So that's what you've got to do to achieve the top, top results. And these are all the things, inclusion of scale, time taken uh, to measure changes, et cetera. So there's a lot of people who have seen the successes that have occurred and they are keen to do it, but they're nervous. And in farming, you've got to be nervous because you never know what's happening next year with the markets or the rain or anything like that. And in the dry areas, the variability is even higher than it usually is. So you've got to be cognizant of things that people really worry about. So the first thing is to attend classes from qualified educators. And I don't know any academic who's, I do, I know one, Jason Rountree. I include myself in that. I've done the science, but I'm only learning now with my, the farm that I've just got on how to manage. I am learning from people who've done it before as managing ranchers. Those are the people and the educators who worked with them those are the people you've got to learn from because they know what's going on. They don't, don't just have to produce papers or get grants. They've got to produce the goods and not wreck their business. So visiting and learning from successful regenerative ranches is essential to get out there and see what they've done. And what I tell people is, okay, you're in this area, just say you're in a seven uh, or 800 millimeter rainfall area. I encourage them to go to an area that's got half that amount of rainfall and see what a guy who knows what he's doing can do on half the amount of rainfall. We've got a research animal scientist who works with us and he gets a certain level of productivity the way he manages his range. Um, and we, we've got 650 millimeters of rainfall where we are. There's a fellow we know who's had droughts for the last seven years. His average rainfall has been uh, 150 millimeters over those periods of time. He is getting, he's shown an improvement and he's getting greater productivity than the animal scientist who I was working with before on more than three times that amount of rain because he's restored the biology of his farm and all the rain he's get, getting is actually going in the ground. So that's the difference. And, and if a person is seen in a drier area, um, a person succeeding, that gives them confidence. But that's just one of the things. You've got to be part of an active regenerating ranching network. We met with a great, uh, really nice bunch of ranchers uh, yesterday, or farmers, and uh, that's the way you've actually got to work. You've got to be able to pick up the phone and talk to somebody who's been there before and say, I've run into this brick wall, what do I do? Uh, so you've got to have that kind of network. Unfortunately, We've got an international network on most uh, Australia, New Zealand, South America, um, the US, Mexico, uh, and Africa. The other thing too is to start small. If you can just set aside an acre or two acres that you just manage, what we do is, is we, um, you know the effect of crawling in Africa, they, they crawl the animals to protect them from uh, at night, they just stick them in there. Do that. If you've got a bare area on your farm, just stick a fence around there, put the animals in there for one night, two nights, 
and then graze out of there during the day and then don't come back there for a year. You will be amazed at the difference that that makes. Just bringing the animal factor in, the droppings, the, the breaking up of, of crusted soil and surface and knocking over old dead plants. Uh, as soon as you see that sort of thing on your property, you've seen with your own eyes, that gives people the confidence to say, okay, how do we make this work on just say a tenth of the ranch? And that, that's what you, when you work with people, you actually have to, to do that because you've got to build confidence and good basic skills. Okay, that's the next one. Persevere. You're going to run into a brick wall many, many times. It's the same as anything in life. You just got to grit your teeth and keep working and keep learning and enjoy yourself. The people, all the meetings we go with regenerative people, if you go to the normal industry meetings, everybody's moaning about the prices and the cost of fertilizer and everything. You go to these meetings and the people want to get up and tell you what they've managed in the last year and they've seen the dung beetles come back here where there was nothing before and there's grasses now where there weren't grasses before. It's just um, probably one of the most satisfying things in the world is to regenerate uh, parts of nature. So you've got to get that working for you. So we're getting towards the end now. Uh, we can build soil carbon and microbial function um, in most environments. Uh, enhance water infiltration, build fertility enormously, control erosion very effectively, uh, and wa watersheds and economic returns while improving the resource base. It enhances wildlife. Um, we, we've, we've worked with people down in, in uh, Patagonia, where once they started, within a year, they, they had to, uh, to get the wildlife people to say, because they were doing such a good job, all the Juanacos for miles around were all coming onto their place. It was just preferred habitat for them. And so you, you have to put up with those kind of problems, but those are small problems uh, sometimes. The other big thing we're finding out, which you just mentioned, is when you have got good soil um, biological activity in there, the, the nutrients that come from the plants are greatly enhanced. Now, you probably know a lot of this, but it's a big factor. And we've got some really good uh, medical scientists now working with nutritionists and stuff. Uh, meeting out those sort of things, getting down to genetic codes and stuff, and and it really is a real deal. And of course, you're increasing the greenhouse gases. So, function and profitability increased with the increasing number of paddocks. You'll see that the, the uh, Martin and Jacoby are, are German scientists. They work in in Argentina, um, and and Namibia, and their work is almost identical with ours. Uh, and they, we all have used short periods of grazing with adequate recovery for profit and ecological function. Um, it's important. Uh, some of our work is, has had non-adaptive management, and that was just following a recipe, the same rest and the same graze. You lose about 30 to 50 percent of your uh, productivity if you just got a recipe there and don't adjust according to prevailing um, climatic conditions. Stocking rates can be increased hugely. In our Mississippi study, uh, they range from four times improvement to five times improvement, starting off within five years. Um, and these are people who, if they, they didn't have enough grass, they would get rid of the cattle. And that's the amount that they've improved their productivity. Fixed management protocols reduced benefits, as I've mentioned earlier. Uh, I'm going to go through quickly here. So the advantages of MP over continuous um, are less at low levels of stocking because the, the, the density of animals with the adequate rest is actually what drives all the biology. Um, and that's important to know that. Short periods of grazing with long recovery um, allow higher stocking rates. And these are really important factors here. They give you higher net returns, your input costs are lower, and importantly, the income variability from year to year is greatly decreased. With as soon as you've got a managed system where the biology is producing a much more constant 
uh, product even um, with a changing environment. And uh, that is all I have for you. This is a shot from Canada. Wow. Thank you very much, Richard P. Don't worry about the lunch. We will have it in a quarter of an hour because we will postpone the presentation of Kun Willekes to this afternoon. That has to do with the fact, I'm very sorry to say that Jos van Reet, whom you know as one of the specialists in grazing regenerative farming, will not be able to be here this afternoon. So we have more time this afternoon for Kun and for questions for uh, Richard, right now, thank you very much. Very spectacular, well uh, documented results. Whom ha who has the first uh, question for Richard? Yes. I'm coming to with the microphone. One moment. Uh, I had complaints not being able to uh, uh, to be uh, uh, listened, to be heard. So, where are you? Oh, I'm sorry. Hello. Um, just to have an idea, how many square meters does a cow get for how many hours? Just to get an idea. Yeah. It's a half a day on a 10 square meters, something like that? Or How big is the paddock? So it's very variable. Can you hear me? Yeah. So uh, in the very dry areas, it's going to be very different to the wet areas. But just in, in the area that we're in, um, You'll have a paddock size of maybe 100, 120 um, acres um, with 50 to 60 animals in it. That's getting up towards the top 10% of the area, and they will be in there for a day and then move on. So you can have fewer animals and leave them in there for a bit longer, like leave them for two days. You never want to leave more than three days because then they start grazing the, the, the regrowth and that just defeats the object of what you're doing. But that last, the picture that I showed on here, this guy was moving two, three times a day. This is uh, Neil Dennis and he moved within 10 years, he moved his soil carbon from less than 1% to 11%. His infiltration rate moved from less than half an inch an hour to eight inches an hour infiltration but not many people want to actually be that intensive we've got one grazer in our area who he moves four or five times a day wow he keeps his herd in in a mob and every two or three hours he will go and lift up the fence and they will go through just like bison really and and they will move through and they are so tame because he moves them all the time uh, we we can walk right next to them, the cows, and watch actually what they eat. And what they eat under that kind of management is just about everything that's there, all the weeds and everything they will eat. Um, whereas if they had half that density and a longer period of grazing, they would eat the, 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 the palatable plants right into the ground and they'd leave all the weed species and you've got a mess. So when you get to the top end, the benefits are huge. But I'm never going to get that far. To me, moving once every day or second day is much more likely what I'm going to be doing. I'm not young anymore. So this means that after 14 days, if you have 14 paddocks, after 14 days, the cattle come back, comes back to the same paddock. No, you, 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 um, you need to have a recovery period of greater than 70 days. 70 days. Seven zero. Okay. But mm. if you're in the in the drier areas, it'll it'll be to be uh, ninety or hundred days rest. That's what you so call we, adaptive multi paddock yes. system. Yes, and you mm. change during quick growth periods. You can move more quickly, come back more quickly. But during dry periods, you've got to slow down and get rid of animals. And of course, of course, we've got a movable electric fences, just a single strand fence. Okay, which, and that's why your change. your argument to have more paddocks to have more uh, change. Well, in what, your, we, uh, yes, what we found is the best results we've achieved, both for the soil regeneration and the associated profits. You've got to do those things at the same time. You've got to balance that. Um, they, they have very quick moves. Um, 
Did you get enough answer to your question? <clears throat> well, I read the book of Joel Salatin, so I was prepared to what I see here. So he even gives in the summertime, I think, hay to his cows if the the growth of the, the grasses don't follow fast enough. So in summertime, he can give he gives, uh, his land some rest period so that he gets in the right uh, time of building up uh, uh, the nutrition in the, in, the, in the grass. Exactly. Yes. So, yeah, Another you. question. Who wants to ask? Uh, yeah, uh, there is a second microphone. I don't know where it is. Uh, we have somebody is there. Yeah, hurry up, Liva. Question. Yes. There, there. OK, first other question. I come I come to you, sir. Uh, Kun first. Hello, uh, Richard. You speak about uh, diversity of grass species, but do you also have leguminous like, species in these uh, paddocks and in these grasslands? Well, uh, I deal with native grasslands, which are highly diverse. Um, I'm not sure what your question is. The leguminous, the legumes. Do you, do you have? To... We've got native legumes there, but they make up about 10, 12 percent in a healthy um, natural state of the total biomass, but they're very important because they diversity of, um, they add the nitrogen factor and add a di diversity to the diet as well as the, the soil diversity. Very important. And this question, Kun, was because of the um, nitrogen, no, because of the carbon uh, sink capacity. Why did you ask uh, this question, Kun? Yeah, because of the nitrogen. That was the reason why this question yeah, the, the was The question is relating to do we, do we have uh, legumes in our pastures and are they important? Yes, because they're a good part of the diet. They add the nitrogen, but then a lot of those grass species are adding nitrogen anyway through the, through the micro, microbial contact. All, all the, the, the C4 uh, grasses that we deal with are VAM-dependent grasses. So they are connected to the microbes and that they get all the stuff that they need there. Yeah, Richard, we have another question. Yes, sir. Sorry, just in relation to, I know you're, you're creating more paddocks by, by just a single strand electric fence. I presume, are you back fencing then to prevent them going backwards? Uh, you don't need to. If you're moving uh, once uh, a day or every two days, you don't really need to. But this particular one here, yes, he did. But he's got one of those gates where uh, there's, there's, he's, he divides an individual paddock uh, that's going to be grazing the day into three portions. And he's got a little timer. So they're equal, uh, three equal things there. And, he, and as soon as the, it goes off, it, it makes a spraying sound. Okay, the cows just lift up their heads and they go straight through the gate. He, he can go away to a conference and he'll set up a week's grazing. And his wife will just come by on the machine and just to make sure everything's happening. And that's it. Taken care of. Next question. Um, thank you very much. Um, my question was, is there an upper limit to the rest period that you might want to have? Like when does when does a long rest turn into a place which is ungrazed? That's Can the paddocks question. rest too long? Yes. Did everybody get the question? Yes. Now, that's a very, very good question. Um, in the higher rainfall areas, uh, a lot of the tropical grasses, the C4 grasses, as soon as they they start uh, getting reproductive, start putting seed out, their quality drops off quite rapidly. So you can't rest. You, you need to graze again before you reach that point. So depending on your year, if you have reasonable uh, quick growth, you're going to have to come back in about 60 days. But if it's a slow growth period, you're going to have to slow that down to about uh, 90 days of rest. So you've got to watch that very carefully. In the drier areas, you don't have a drop off in the nutrition of your grasses nearly as much. So it's actually less, it's more important to have the good recovery um, and it's less important under that circumstance. That's what you mean with management for green leaves is as long as uh, you can. Uh, that, that's a significant part greens, of it, what, yes. yes. But the other thing too is if you're managing for, for biodiversity, uh, you get a spread in, in the optimal growing season for each one of those species, some of them grow well into cool periods of the year. So if you've got that mix, there's a natural uh, lengthening of the green season 
for animal nutrition and for, for photosynthesis. Next question. Yes, I have actually two questions. One is on, uh, I assume this is for uh, beef or meat. Uh, in the yes. Netherlands, we do a lot for milk. Is that significantly different? And the second is, do you include any bushes or trees in your, uh, in your research? Yes, but not all the research, because when you're working with a, with, a, with a farmer, you've got to measure what he's got on his place. But you choose it so that when you're making comparison, you've got, you're comparing apples with apples. Um, but the, the beneficial uh, effects of the trees is huge. The latest paper what we put out now after 10 years of research shows that those trees, they put extra carbon uh, around the, the canopy. The leaves that fall off from, from the trees, they break down much more slowly, so you get a, a quicker buildup of soil carbon there with all the benefits that accrue from that. So the other side of that is if you have too many trees, and we've done that research too, as soon as you give above about 20, 25% of aerial cover of the woody species, then there's too much competition. So you need to manage that component as a separate entity. But okay. trees are a good, a good thing to have. And then the question about dairy farming systems. Do you have dairy cows, uh, milking cows in your system? Or we we haven't done research on them, but I, I work with quite a few people who do that. And you saw that one that I showed when you go mixed cropping. In the, in the wetter areas, you can do dairy. Um, otherwise, you've got to have irrigation and stuff. But, you know, it's just the normal um, good grazing uh, that dairy farmers know. Strip grazing, um, you know, all, all the same principles apply. And uh, the same as the natural systems, you don't need to put fertilizer on or any of those inputs. And they have learned how to do that. Uh, I, I just haven't got enough to show you that. Okay, next question. Um, um, well, I was wondering how would you see this uh, system be economically viable in Western Europe? As I did a quick uh, cal calculation for our Dutch uh, systems and that would need, would be a around one cow per day per hectare. So you will need more than 3000 hectares to get around with 50 cows. That's financially impossible. So one thing you'll, are, are you a farmer? Okay, yes. so when when you when you get an idea and you and you get a pencil and you start working out all these things, that's a long way to go before you actually have a working system. We've got dairy farmers that um, they farmers find a way of doing things more cheaply, and it, it pays extremely well. Well, there is of course a difference between range farming which is so like wild west farming, I think, and then the, the very high yeah, intensive well, to, level. To of give you some kind of uh, insight, a hectare of grassland in Holland, one oh. hectare, which is 2.15 acres, will cost you around 50 to 60,000 euros to have that amount of land. And if you can only milk about one cow on 50 hectares during a year, it's going to be impossible. No, yeah, I, okay. I, I understand. I understand your question, and you're quite right. When you when your land prices are that high, uh, you've got to have exceptional circumstances exactly. to, to be able to make it pay. Yeah. Next uh, question. If if I can uh, just answer uh, Peter from Observe. Um, uh, in these uh, regions, we um, normally calculate about uh, uh, between two and three dairy cows per hectare because. Um, um, you mean here in Western Europe? Yeah, in Belgium, Holland, okay. we have uh, mm -hmm. uh, several examples, so it uh, it works. Uh, you can go for 100% yeah. grazing, no problem. And do you aim at the the less fertile um, fields or? Oh, Sorry. Well, do you pick the less fertile fields for this system or uh, no, any that, field that, at that's, all? That's also the difference, um, uh, Richard. Uh, has more experience, I think, in more um, uh, drier uh, regions uh, where we have more, a lot of more uh, grass production Rainfall, per hectare. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe three. No, three the, from I, I don't know your farming systems here at all, but one of the people that have been um, the, the most formative people for my ideas and my research was from Wageningen, uh, Doe van der Ploeg, 
He produced a paper with a couple of co-authors in 2006, and they deal with all these issues there. Um, and that's well worth read. That's that's a classical piece of research. Um, and uh, that, that could answer some of the questions here. And to add André Vosvin, uh, who was originally yes. also uh, the founder, let's say, all, um, his all experience the, in Brittany was also uh, with these numbers of cows and this kind of production uh, system in, in Brittany. So no, That's correct. André Vosvin is the people who people follow mostly, and we just adapted it in Africa for dry environments, but he's the original guy who did it, yeah. Richard, what about crop protection systems? Did you ever try to translate it to non-grazing systems? This Yes. Yes? And unfortunately, Tell Chris, Chris should have chatted, but I've got a slide in there where I show that if you go from, if you, uh, conventional tillage, the you're in the red. In other words, you, you're decreasing your, your ecosystem services. If you change over to no-till, and no-till with a single cover crop, no-till with um, uh, mixed cover crops, um, and then add animals in this grazing system at the end, uh, you do, everyone is a step up. And as soon as you bring the animal factor in there, it improves all the ecological functions because of the dung beetles and earthworms and stuff like that that really take off when when you've got the animal factor in there. So, we, so then as, we're as, talking as, rotation, plant yes, production, no, and so then you, uh, there's crop raising. rotations, and then there's crop rotations within uh, and, and, and a, a grazing component in that. So prior to the First and Second World Wars, the scientists and, and farmers had really were doing that sort of thing very, very well. And we've gone back to learning that. Gabe Brown and these people who are so successful, they had three droughts that put them out of business, so they couldn't borrow money from the bank or anything. So they had to go back with the NRCS, the USDA, to go back to previous systems from the early 1900s, where they didn't need all those expensive things. They used cover crops and they came right. They, they resuscitated their businesses, paid for it themselves, and they've never looked back. Other questions? Are we satisfied? Please. Um, thanks a lot for your very fascinating presentation. I, I was, you talked a lot about grazing, but I wanted to know if there was also a role for bonocastrics like chicken or pigs in such kind of systems. Oh. Yeah, good question. And in fact, and, and that's where people like Salatin, um, where the land is expensive, you have to go, cattle are, are low in terms of ecological efficiency because they produce less than one offspring a year. As soon as you go to sheep, you get a better uh, return, better cash flow. As soon as you go to pigs then chickens uh, and turkeys and stuff like that, then it just speeds up everything because it's a much more uh, effective and, and and quicker turnover. So yeah, those are the options available to you, and they they all work very 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 well. There's there's a fellow in in Georgia, um, who's who's got a couple of podcasts out, uh, showing what he's done with bringing uh, five different species of grazers, um, uh, cattle, sheep, hogs, uh, chickens, turkeys. Uh, I think there's one or two others as well. But uh, that's part of the principle of bringing the biodiversity in, and you can handle your disease much better that way. You can you can give a break of a species as soon as you. The the, the worst country for a sheep uh, is is continuously grazed sheep area. So if you can bring in another animal or two species animals in the interim before you graze again, there are huge benefits to that, and they they all improve the fertility with the correct management. Salatin's an excellent bloke to follow for that. You need another kind of fence, I suppose. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Other question? No questions anymore. Last question, Anton. And then we go for lunch. Please. Uh, yes, he said, do you uh, use in your system also uh, crops for arable land? So, so do, do you uh, make mixtures of cattle uh, systems with arable land production? Yes, I, I was asked to deal with just the grazing component, but we've, we've got examples of that, because otherwise you've got to have double talks. 
Thank you very much for your attention. This afternoon we have more presentations.